Hello everyone, my name is Lev, and this is the first in a series of videos documenting my progress in building a 1970s era computer out of discrete transistors. My ultimate goal is to play Tetris on this thing, but I'll also like to program in Conway's Game of Life, a program to do some mathematical calculations, such as computing digits of pi, uh, maybe even a basic interpreter if I have time. Now, as you can see, I've already started assembling the CPU, but in this video I want to focus on the architecture of the computer. So I'll be explaining the various buses, registers, flags, and how they all interface to make a working computer. In future videos, I'll be explaining the program counter, the registers, the ALU, the memory unit, and all the other components which make the CPU. So to start with a little personal background, I don't have any formal electrical engineering or computer engineering training. So one of my goals with this project was to simply learn more about how computers work at the fundamental level. When designing this computer, I took inspiration from a number of sources. My first experience with computer architecture was when I watched Ben Eater's 8-bit computer series. This series explains how to build a basic 8-bit computer entirely out of logic gates. It's an excellent series, and I highly recommend checking it out if you haven't already. I never got around to building Ben Eater's computer in real life, but I did build it in Minecraft at least. A few years later, I became interested in relay computers because of the super satisfying clicking sound of the switching relays. I actually finished designing a full relay computer based on Joe Allen's architecture, but I only got as far as building an 8-bit program counter. While doing research for this project, I learned all about stack pointers, memory management, and other fundamental principles of computer architecture. When the quarantine started a few months ago, I became interested in retrocomputing again when I saw James Newman's megaprocessor, which is a humongous transistor computer built over the course of five years and using over 40,000 transistors. I really wanted to see it in person, but I lived pretty far away, so I decided to build my own. Of course, I didn't really want to spend five years soldering, and I don't have tens of thousands of dollars to spend, so I looked for ways to maximize computational power while minimizing size. As a benchmark, I wanted the computer to be fast enough to play Tetris, and yet mathematically capable of computing at least a dozen digits of pi. Now, I'm still pretty young. I was born in an age of sleek laptops and cell phones. I don't have any experience programming in BASIC on a Commodore 64, or flipping switches on a PDP-11. Before I could design my own computer, I had to understand the architectures of classic processors, such as the Z80, the 6502, as well as full computers such as the ones in the PDP series. After a month or so of reading old manuals and designing logical components on breadboards, I finally settled on an architecture which fit my design goals. Here were my design goals and design limitations. First was a limited clock speed. Although the MOSFETs I'm using can switch in as little as 20 nanoseconds, such a speed can only be achieved with a current of 200 milliamps per transistor. With thousands of transistors, this means that the computer would burn over a kilowatt of power, which for obvious reasons is unfeasible. While designing the computer, I had to not only maximize the clock speed, but also minimize the amount of cycles each assembly instruction takes. So far, the components I built can run stably at 300 kHz, which is a very reasonable speed for such a project. Secondly, I wanted to limit the number of transistors on the computer. To prevent my plans from becoming too ambitious and unrealistic, I decided to cap my transistor count at around 4,000 transistors. This is approximately the number of transistors in the 6502 microprocessor, so I could still achieve quite a bit with this upper limit. I also plan to take this project with me when I go to college, so I wanted it to be able to fit in a side of a regular size suitcase after disassembly. I also wanted my computer to be able to run existing programs, without me having to code them completely from scratch. There are some fundamental limit differences between my architecture and the 6502 architecture, but they are similar enough that I could easily modify 6502 assembly code into machine code for my computer. If this conversion process could be automated, it would make the software side of this project significantly easier. The computer should be fast enough to run Tetris. In terms of pure computational power, a single double-pull, double-throw relay is significantly more powerful than a MOSFET transistor. The obvious downside to relays is their speed. I could have easily implemented Tetris on a relay computer, but each move would take several hours to process. This is one of the main reasons why I decided to switch to transistors. The computer should be mathematically powerful enough to calculate a dozen digits of pi in a few seconds. This goal is obviously related to the previous one. If I can get the computer to run fast enough, even a limited ALU can work wonders. There are some difficulties, however. For one thing, I have a limited amount of transistors, and a large ALU can slow down the computer tremendously. I made several key decisions early on. For instance, I wouldn't have a built-in multiplication or division command. There would be no hardware-based floating point implementation. With these limitations into consideration, there are many small optimizations I can make, which will greatly improve the computer's mathematical capabilities. So with all this introduction out of the way, let's take a look at what I settled on. The first major decision I made was that the computer would have a 16-bit data bus and a 16-bit address bus. The 16-bit address bus is pretty common for computers at the time. It means that I can access tens of thousands of lines of assembly code. The 16-bit data lines aren't a standard, 
Many processors at the time, such as the 6502, had 8-bit data lines. This works fine for computers running at several megahertz, but I really wanted to squeeze the most juice out of my relatively slow, slow clock speed of 300 kilohertz. The main reason I chose a 16-bit design was speed. These days, SRAM memory is pretty cheap, so the extra size wasn't an issue. Similarly, the RAM chips I'll be using take only several nanoseconds to read and write to. However, many of the components in my computer take several microseconds to run, so memory access time isn't a limiting factor. In 8-bit processors, accessing a memory location takes two CPU cycles, one to load the high byte and then one to load the low byte. In the 6502, some instructions involving memory access can take up to six CPU cycles. For my computer, I realized that if I use the 16-bit address bus, not only can I save on control logic, but I could also fit all of my instructions in the instruction set into less than four cycles. I also decided to use 16-bit opcodes for my instructions. This is pretty wasteful in terms of memory, but it saves me a lot of transistors for the decode realm. Again, memory is cheap, but soldering hundreds of transistors is less so. Now let's take a look at the registers. In a computer architecture, a register is a small group of memory units used to temporarily store data or instructions. While a modern CPU can have dozens of registers, my design only uses four. Let's begin with the accumulator. The accumulator is a 16-bit register used to perform mathematical operations which take more than a single instruction to execute. It can be used as an input to the ALU, or it can be used to store the end result of a computation. It can also simply be used as a temporary place to store data during a transfer operation. For instance, suppose I wanted to add the numbers 37 and 54. First, I would load the number 37 into the accumulator using the command LDA immediate 37. Next, I would add the number 54 using the command add immediate 54. This add immediate instruction adds the contents of the accumulator to the operand and saves the answer back into the accumulator. So the result 91 would be saved into the accumulator. Another use of the accumulator is to move data from one memory location to another. Suppose I have a memory location X and I want to move the data stored there into a different memory location Y. I can do this in the following way. First, I would load the data at X into the accumulator using the instruction LDAX. Next, I would store the data from the accumulator into memory location Y using the instruction STAY. In some architectures, such as the 8x86, one could simply use the instruction move X to Y, but my architecture only supports instructions with single parameters, so moving data takes two instructions. The next register on our list is the program counter. The program counter is a special register which points to the current instruction the computer is executing. In my computer, the program counter is 16 bits, so the computer can directly access 65,536 words of memory, which would be more than enough for most programs I would want to write on this computer. The program counter can do two things. It can increment to the next memory location, or it can jump to a designated address. This jump can also be conditional, meaning the program counter will only jump if some conditions in the computer are met. This allows us to use if statements, create loops, and jump to subroutines. Similar to the program counter, we also have a register called the stack pointer. This also points to a location in memory, but the stack pointer is only 8 bits, meaning it can point to 256 distinct memory locations. This small segment of memory to which the stack pointer can refer to is called the stack, which is used to store temporary data. Unlike an array, we can only insert or remove one piece of data at a, at a time. When we push data onto the stack, the stack pointer increments and saves the data at the location. When we pull a piece of data from the stack, the stack pointer removes the piece of data and decrements the stack pointer. In some ways, this is like a stack of plates. We can either place one on top or remove the topmost one. This structure is immensely useful in a computer for the following reason. Suppose we're trying to write a program to calculate some complex equation for us. Let's say this equation requires a lot of square roots to solve. Instead of typing in the square root code each time, we'll write a separate method called square root. To use this method, we load our value into the accumulator, call the square root function, and receive our answer back in the accumulator. So for example, First, we load 64 into the accumulator, then we jump to the square root subroutine. Once we're inside the square root subroutine, the code runs as expected. But now that we've reached the end, what next? We need some weight to return back to our main program. We could pass the return address as a parameter, however that wastes time and becomes tedious. If we use the stack, there is a very elegant solution. Instead of simply jumping to the subroutine, we'll use a command called JSR or jump to subroutine. JSR is basically a fancy jump. It will jump to the designated address, but it will also push the address of the next instruction onto the stack. Then, at the end of the square root method, we call RTS, or return from subroutine. This pulls the topmost element off the stack and jumps to that address, leading us back to the main method. This is a really powerful concept. Now, not only can we easily jump to subroutines, but we can also jump to a subroutine from inside of a subroutine, or even perform recursion. But not forever. The stack has a limited size, 
So if we call too many nested functions, we'll get what's called a stack overflow error. This is what usually happens in most programming languages when you try to run an infinite loop. The stack runs out of memory for return addresses and local variables. For us, we don't need very complex flows in our programs, so 256 words of stack memory should be more than enough. Last but not least, we have a status flags register. The status flags register is a 4-bit register containing four flags, or single bits of data representing the state of the processor. For instance, we have a zero flag, which is set if the result of the previous computation was zero. Similarly, we have a sign flag for testing if a number is negative, a carry flag for performing large arithmetic operations, and an overflow flag to test for overflow in the ALU. For those of you familiar with the 6502 microprocessor, you may be wondering where the index registers are. This was a tough decision to make, but I decided against using index registers to save transistors and to increase speed. Overall, the two index registers in the 6502 would add about 700 to 1,000 transistors to my design, including the necessary control logic. Sure, this makes programming a bit easier and more efficient, but I'd rather use those transistors in making a 16-bit ALU. Since memory access to my computer is much easier than in the 6502, I felt that this was a necessary trade-off. With that said, let's take a look at my computer's addressing modes. Unlike the 6502, my computer has very few addressing modes. The simplest is the implied addressing mode, where the operand is implied in the opcode. For instance, the CLC operation clears the carry flag, no operand needed. Similarly, the PHA command pushes the contents of the accumulator onto the stack. Each of these instructions only takes a single word of memory. Next, we have the immediate addressing mode. In this mode, the operand is used to directly perform the computation. Examples of this are LDA immediate 37, where the value 37 is loaded directly into the accumulator. These instructions take up two words of memory, one for the instruction opcode, one for the operand. Next, there is the absolute addressing mode. In this mode, the operand specifies a memory location. The data stored at the memory location is used in the computation. An example of this is the command STA56, which will store the contents of the accumulator into memory location 56. As before, these instructions take up two words of memory. Last but not least, we have the indirect addressing mode. In the previous mode, the location specified by the operand is assumed to contain data. But in this mode, the location specified by the operand contains the actual data location. For instance, if we use the instruction LDA indirect 56, whatever value stored at the location 56 is used as a location for the data. This is really useful for looping through data and using pointers in code, but it takes a little bit longer than the previous modes. Well, these addressing modes are great and all, but let's see them in action. Say we want to index through a segment of memory, to clear a display or to print hello world. The message hello world is really just a sequence of bytes, looking something like this. To know when the message ends, we'll place a zero byte after the exclamation mark so our program knows when to stop printing. To read the message on the 6502, one could use the index registers along with an absolute indexed addressing mode. This looks something like this. First, we load zero into the X register, which is one of the index registers in the 6502. Then, we load the first byte of the message we want to print using the instruction LDA message start comma X. Here, message start is the address of the first byte, and the comma X means that the contents of the X register is added to this address. Since the X register is now zero, the first byte of the message is loaded into the accumulator. This use of the offset is called the absolute indexed addressing mode. My computer does not support this. Before printing, let's check if we reach the end of the message. This BEQ instruction is one of those conditional jump instructions I talked about earlier. It will jump to the exit label only if the accumulator is zero. Otherwise, we just move on. Next, we run some code to interact with the display printing the ASCII character stored in the accumulator by jumping to a print character subroutine. Then, we increment the index register using increment x, and to continue printing, we'll just jump back to the main loop. So as you can see, this index register, along with the absolute indexed addressing mode, is an incredibly useful way of indexing through an array of data. To write such a program on my computer, I could use the indirect addressing mode, but a quicker solution is just to make use of self-modifying code. In terms of hardware, this solution to use self-modifying code is certainly easier to understand, but the software is much more complex. The main idea is still quite similar, though. We have some sort of index variable. We load the data at index plus the message start into the accumulator. We check if we're at the end of the message. If yes, we exit. Otherwise, we'll call the print character subroutine. We increment the index, and we jump back to the loop. On the 6502, this index variable is stored in the X register. On my computer, the index variable is stored in the code itself. What do I mean? Well, let's take a look at the code to see. First, we load the start of the message into our index variable. 
so that we begin by pointing to the start of the message. For simplicity, I've put line numbers next to the instructions. By the way, these labels such as message start are only placeholders for us to be able to understand the code. The CPU doesn't see these labels. In place of message start, it will just see the 16-bit location which message start represents. So message start is some predetermined address where we stored our message, but where is the index memory location? Let's keep going. As you can see here, the index variable is just whatever is stored at memory location 5. Memory location 5 could start out as anything, it really doesn't matter. Once the first two instructions run, the instruction at line 4 will read load message start, hence loading the first byte into the accumulator. As before, we check if we've reached the end. Next, we of course print the character, then we'll increment the index. Note that we're literally editing memory location 5 with this command. Now, the command will read load message start plus 1. We'll jump back to the loop with the jump instruction, and the cycle continues until the end of the message. Using this idea of self-modifying code, we can essentially do everything which the 6502 does, and the code isn't even that much longer. It also takes a similar amount of time to run as a 6502 version. I should probably address the elephant in the room. Self-modifying code only works when you can modify code during runtime. This little trick doesn't work when I'm reading from a code from a read-only chip. In that case, I'll have to use the slower indirect addressing mode. This discussion of ROM and RAM brings us to the memory map. Unlike many computers from the 70s, my computer will have a hard drive in the form of a several gigabyte micro SD card. What a time to be alive, I can buy a several gigabyte SD card the size of my fingernail for only a few bucks. Anyways, on startup, the computer will read code from a tiny boot ROM, which contains 256 words of memory. This ROM chip will load the operating system from the hard drive, which will then load whatever it needs for runtime. The reason why the boot ROM is so tiny is because I don't want to have to fully reprogram the ROM chip every time I edit the operating system. It's much easier just to edit an SD card. This brings us to the memory map. My computer actually has quite a simplistic memory map. As we've just discussed, the first 256 words of memory are reserved for the boot ROM, so from address hex 00 to hex ff. Next up is the stack, also only 256 words of memory. This takes up addresses hex 100 to hex 1ff. Past this is general purpose memory, taking up addresses hex 200 to fffff. Also, any memory location can be reserved as an input or output port. This isn't directly handled by the control logic. It requires a separate register connected to the bus. So I can add as many ports as I want, assuming I don't run out of transistors first. Let's look at a block diagram of my computer and how this instruction set is implemented. As I said before, we have two 16-bit buses, one for memory addresses and one for data. The program counter and stack pointer can directly output their data onto the address bus, which feeds into the address of the memory unit. The simplest unit connected to the data bus is the instruction latch, which stores the current instruction and outputs it to the control logic. Connected to the data bus is a memory latch, which is used to temporarily store data coming out of the memory unit for use in later cycles. The accumulator can read or write to the data bus, and then it is connected to the first input to the ALU. The second input to the ALU is connected to the data bus. The output of the ALU is either fed back into the accumulator or into an ALU latch, which is used in four cycle instructions or in the indirect addressing mode. To understand what's going on here, let's trace through a few instructions. First, let's see what happens when we use the add with carry instruction. On the first cycle, the data stored at the program counter is moved into the instruction latch. This happens in every single instruction, it's called the fetch cycle. At the same time this is happening, the program counter is incremented. On the second cycle, the data stored at the program counter is saved into the memory latch. This is the operand. Again, the program counter is incremented simultaneously. In the final cycle, several things happen at once. The memory latch writes to the memory unit, the memory unit writes to the data bus, and the ALU outputs the sum of the data bus, the accumulator, and the carry flag back into the accumulator. If instead we want to save the data back into the operand location instead, the ALU outputs to the ALU latch, and in the next cycle, the ALU latch is saved into memory. This structure is used for pretty much all of the ALU instructions, the only difference being the actual ALU operation. Another interesting instruction we'll trace is the jump to subroutine instruction. First, the data stored at the program counter is moved into the instruction latch, and the program counter is incremented. Next, the data stored at the program counter is stored in the memory latch, and again, the program counter is incremented. Now the program counter is pointing at the next location in memory. So the stack pointer writes to the memory bus, the program counter outputs to the data bus, and the memory unit reads from the data bus. At the same time, the stack pointer is incremented. Finally, the operand we saved in the memory latch writes to the program counter, completing the jump. 
So this video is already getting a bit lengthy, so I'll wrap it up here. In the next video, I'll be showcasing my build of the program counter, which consists of about 500 transistors. I'll explain the circuits I built at the level of individual transistors, and how the circuits connect to create a program counter. I'll also explain some issues I ran into while running this computer at 400kHz, and how I solved them. For now, thank you for watching, and I will see you next time.